Okay, so let's get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Michael Bellicosa, head of adult programming here. I think most of you know that. Uh, I think you all know Mark Schenker, so I'll skip the intro stuff. And uh, one note before we start. Okay, so like we did in the summer, we are aiming to have Mark give this lecture from the Brubeck room next Thursday. We will point a camera at him so that it, it will still be go out over Zoom. But if, uh, if there's enough interest from folks like you and the weather holds up and everything else, uh, Mark will come down here and give this from the Brubeck room next Thursday. And that will conclude the series and we'll have a little wine and cheese and a little snack uh, after the program for 15, 20, 30 minutes of just uh, chatting with each other. So for me to be able to decide if we're going to do it that way, I need you all to tell me if you're going to come. So I will send you all a note tomorrow morning. Just respond very briefly, but as quickly as you can, uh, whether you would be coming in person to the Brubeck Room at the library uh, next Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. And if we get enough interest, uh, we'll line it up. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, very interesting. I'm sure that most of us read this book a long time ago. Some of you probably read it recently, maybe this week. Um, and I think it's going to be a very interesting lecture, and I'm sure you're going to have a lot of good comments. Thanks. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Michael. Let me say that poll about whether you'll come to the last session and do it in person, give you good practice for the midterm elections. I'm not electioneering. It's just a fact. So... Um, October is always my busiest month for book groups. This is the 20th day of the month, and this is my 10th book event this month. <clears throat> and with that, I'm happy that it's The Catcher in the Rye, a book that I came to late. I did not read it until I was a graduate student in English, and I have done it with my book groups. But this is the first time, I believe, that I'm lecturing at it in a public about it in a public venue in a library. What I'd like you to keep in mind, and I hinted at this in earlier talks uh, this season uh, about the rise of the teenager, uh, what happens to American culture in the 50s. We're not going into the 60s, but it carries into the 60s, of course. And if you needed a shorthand way of thinking about the theme tonight, one way to think of it is that the modernist experience of alienation meets the teenage um, phenomenon of mid-century, and uh, you have alienated uh, teenagers. Uh, and that becomes a very powerful force in popular culture, television, movies, literature, um, stage and screen, all of that. <clears throat> if you want a little bit of cocktail party trivia, you might be interested in knowing that the hyphenated word that uh, I'm going to call GD because I won't use the language that he uses. The expletive GD occurs in this short novel 245 times. I'm always impressed that somebody actually counted that. So I want to put this in cultural context. In 1942, the 27-year-old critic Alfred Kazin, he was one of the people with Irving Howe who helped resurrect uh, call it sleep. He published his first book, a masterpiece of criticism about American literature called On Native Grounds. And I'm quoting from that book, the single greatest fact about our modern American writing is our writer's absorption in every last detail of their American world, so very much absorbed by the world they were writing about, and with their deep and subtle alienation from it. Kazin put his finger on something that's true of a lot of the mid-century writers. They are deeply committed to knowing the country of their origin, even as they themselves feel a deep and subtle alienation from it. Why should that be? More than a decade later, post-war America was experiencing such high uh, employment and such a high standard of middle-class living, this is the Eisenhower years of 1953 and on, that Robert Lowell, a magnificent poet, published a poem in 1958 
in which he describes a scene on Marlboro, Marlboro Street in Boston. And this is just an excerpt. Where even the man scavenging filth in the back alley trash cans has two children, a beach wagon, a helpmate, and is a, quote, young Republican. Even the homeless guy scrounging has this profile. That's how successful and accomplished and conservative uh, America is in the view of this poet in 1958. The deep and subtle alienation, that's the phrase from Kazin, that he identified as characteristic of the modern American writer was brought into greater relief during the decade that Lowell calls in that same poem, the tranquilized 50s. So that alienation that Howe talks about is earlier in American literature than the 40s and 50s. But I'm applying it now, Lowell was applying it to the tranquilized 50s, when in the view of contemporary writers and intellectuals, complacency was the dominant mood of middle-class America. An America which, in the words of William H. Pritchard, had become, quote, a Philistine and materialistic nation run by businessmen, generals, and golfers. What a magnificent phrase. Businessmen, generals, and golfers. Remember, a general is in the White House uh, and golfing in the 1950s. I leave to your own memories feeling these writers that they could not possibly be appreciated, let alone understood by mass market readers, individual novelists created unheroic or non-functioning or malfunctioning protagonists as a protest against the success-oriented citizenry of mid 20th century America. We see this in Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, where the protagonist literally lives underground. And in Norman, Ma Norman Mailer's The Man Who Studied Yoga, both published in 1952. Remember, Catcher in the Rye is 1951. And we see it in Saul Bellow's short and powerful novel, Seize the Day, published in 1956, in which Tommy Wilhelm cannot gain control of his own life, let alone seize the American dream, which is what he's after. He's a middle manager with uneven success and everything goes downhill from there. What happens when such alienation with the materialistic, complacent, bourgeois, um, labor-saving devices in every kitchen, the dominance of network television, what happens when such alienation people, writers, disaffected by that, combined with the emergence of the rise of American youth as central to the culture of the United States in the 50s and 60s. Now, when I say central to the culture, lots of things can be central to the culture. I don't mean the only thing. But the transformation of how young people were seen in the 20s when Fitzgerald was writing, or even the 40s during the war years, and how they were seen in the 50s is radically different. Holden Caulfield is what happens when alienation meets the rise of the teenager. A confused and disillusioned, but not unsympathetic 16-year-old who not only cannot seize the day, has no interest in seizing anything, is, uh, has rejected anything associated with the world of adults as phoniness, culturally, where did Holden come from? Well, the word teenager with a hyphen, T-E-E-N hyphen A-G-E-R. And if you know something about word formation, um, combined words, combined words are hyphenated when they're new. So if you see a text in which someone who knows what they're doing is not just making a mistake, writes teenager as hyphenated two words, you know it's a new word. Teenager was first used in the United States in 1944. And it was employed after the war largely as a marketing term to recognize that these young people now had income that advertisers wanted to target.
but later on it moved without the hyphen to be a marker of American youth who were increasingly seen as self-separating and rebellious. When the term Bobby Soxer first appeared uh, in 1943 in a new uh, Time Magazine article, it was describing the semi-hysterical um, fans, female fans of people like Frank Sinatra. And although they were considered odd, they were not considered dangerous. First of all, they were girls. And I say that meaning what they thought, not what I think. Secondly, they were doing something that had happened for a long time, people adoring someone who they think of as a sexy or charismatic performer. Um, and they were not involved in anything close to alienation. They were buying tickets. They were buying refreshments. They were part of the American consumers. But the teenager became a figure of rebelliousness and isolation. Again, this novel is 1951. In 1955, the movie Blackboard Jungle, based on a novel of the year before by Evan Hunter, appeared in theaters. It was the first movie to feature a rock and roll song, Bill Haley and his comets rock around the clock. You know it. Come on, sing it with me. Uh, in its soundtrack, it played over the opening and closing credits. And many theaters, especially in small towns, were so unnerved by this that they ran the opening credits and killed the sound so that you could not hear the lyrics and the beat of the music of Rock Around the Clock. Some theaters wouldn't play the music at the end either. In the movie, uh, Glenn Ford plays a teacher named Mr. Dadier, D-A-D-I-E-R. And when he writes his name on the board, one of the delinquents throws a pool ball, cue ball, into the blackboard, knocking out the, I, uh, the ER and leaving behind a circular hole. And that boy yells out, hey, Mr. Daddy-O, uh, the D-A-D-I with the O a term that had existed before in jazz circles to talk about somebody who was part of the cult of jazz. But based on the movie, it became a word used by teenagers to talk about older men, and not always positively. That was 1956, 55. In the same year, Rebel Without a Cause, which I referenced earlier um, in the, this series, um, was uh, released and an enormous hit, not just with young people, but especially with them. Earlier movies about teenagers going back to the Depression depicted them as caught in urban slum environments. They were part of the liberal filmmakers' notion that America's youth is being misserved by the urban atmosphere of stagnation. Uh, they were seen as juvenile delinquents as a consequence of their social standing, but they weren't seen as aimless and misguided as a group. That took Rebel Without a Cause and movies that followed, where the youth in that film are aimless, emotionally confused, middle-class teens living in the suburbs. These are not disadvantaged children. And I should say that um, one of the markers of how seriously Hollywood took this is that in both Blackboard Jungle, uh, which features a very young Sidney Poitier, a young Vic Morrow, uh, and in Rebel Without a Cause, teenagers were played for the first time in major Hollywood movies by adults. This is not an insignificant fact. Uh, you know, movies today try to get young looking actors or actually young actors uh, to play teenagers uh, for credibility's sake. But one of the ways you can mark culture is people now thought that these teenagers who were carrying the weight of leads and co stars in the movie, Sidney Poitier is one of the good impoverished kids in this school who comes to the aid eventually of the much older uh, Glenn Ford. Um, if you have 
older actors playing teenagers, not for credibility, but for prestige. It means you're putting a lot of value in the teenage story. And then famously on the 9th of September in 1956, Elvis Presley appeared for the first time on the Ed Sullivan Show. You all know the story of one appearance, his uh, not being able to have his lower half of his body um, uh, filmed uh, for fear that it would arouse people's carnality. Um, this was revolutionary on an order, I think, even topping the Beatles um, um, nearly a decade later. Uh, these were monumental things in the change of how young people were seen. So Holden is a combination of the alienation that comes to the fore in the 50s when the writers creating such characters are upset with the complacency of American life and do not feel that the solution is in religion or philosophical existentialism or the romanticism of the pioneer self or the connection with the wilderness that you see in James Fenimore Cooper or Emerson's famous self-reliance whereby finding your own strength, you connect to the strength of other individuals. Whitman's notion that America is best seen as a field that has leaves of grass. He avoided blades of grass for the title of his book because he knew that if he said blades of grass, people would just see it uh, as a cliche. But by saying leaves of grass, when you and I don't think of grass as having leaves, he would make us see that a field or a lawn is made up of innumerable individual leaves and that each of us is one of those leaves. And by asserting our own selfhood, the poem that he talks about, this is Song of Myself. If we do that by articulating our own selfhood, we connect with the other selves that make a democracy. None of those avenues for addressing the problem of alienation, commitment to an enterprise like going whaling, or any of the things that was true of American writers and heroes earlier, seems to be available to Holden. Uh, instead, in his quest for moral goodness, and that's one of the things that makes him, I think, sympathetic and endearing, his quest for moral goodness in a deeply ambiguous moral world, Holden has literary forebears in American literature, most significantly Huckleberry Finn. Another striking mix of innocence and experience of ignorance and natural intelligence. And in a young man, in a teenager, and like Huck, Holden creates himself in a picaresque, I'll come back to that word in a second, plotless tale he tells us, rendered in contemporary dialect, as with Twain's teenager, because both young men display their vanity along with their sporadic self-confidence via performing themselves. Both books have narrators who are both self-doubting and self-affirming. And they speak in their own language. For many Northern readers of the day, Huckleberry Finn was a challenge. That may include some people in this room. For many adult readers in the 50s encountering Holden Caulfield, not just because of the GD word, but the F word appears not hundreds of times, but a handful of times. And, and there's a kind of in your face um, this to it, a kind of um, naturalist naturalism to it that would put people off. But he has that in common with Huckleberry Finn. And I want to remind you that one of the striking things about Huck is that when he learns that the black man he's with is an escaped slave and he knows that it's wrong to be complicit in helping a slave escape, he gives in to the morality that has been imprinted on him by racist Southern society. And he writes a letter that would turn Jim over to the authorities. Uh, they were in the river and because of a storm, they wound up instead of going north to freedom, 
at uh, Cairo, Illinois. They take a turn to the south, and the rest of the novel, they're in slave territory, which Twain did purposely because it's a better novel if they're in slave territory. He writes this note, and he intends to turn Huck in because he wants to be a good boy. He wants to try to do the right thing. And then he has a change of heart, and he rips up that note and says famously, all right, then I'll go to hell. And he says that not ironically. He thinks that in ripping up the note and not turning the escaped slave over to the authorities, he is doing a wrong thing because that's what he's been taught. And he doesn't trust his natural instinct that no human being should be owned by another. And what Twain does brilliantly is he just doesn't have uh, Huck change his mind. He has him write the one thing and then undo it. So the act of defiance becomes an actual act. You can't depict someone changing their mind, but you can depict forcefully someone writing a letter and then ripping it up. Holden doesn't have that kind of dramatic moment, but he's filled with instances where his instincts are good, even though his thinking is confused. His desire to save children, not just from the adult world of phoniness, but let's be honest, from death, uh, lost his young brother to leukemia, um, tells us very late in the novel, which is intentional on uh, Salinger's part and unintentional on Holden part about James Castle, a suicide, uh, a skinny guy uh, beat up because he wouldn't apologize for saying something and then throws himself out a window. That comes, that revelation comes very late in the novel. That story is told to us as a memory that Holden has when his sister's saying, you don't like anything. What's one thing that you like? And as he's trying to answer that question, which she's repeated multiple times, he thinks of James Castle. And finally, he answers that the thing he likes is he liked Allie. We'll come back to James Castle later. But Holden has good instincts about wanting to save children from death, wanting to save them from a world where obscenities are written on the walls of museums, want to save them from pervy people uh, who might have an interest in abusing them, and that he wakes up so fearfully late in the novel when Mr. Antolini, who seems to be an entirely positive character who's looking out for Holden, uh, is seen hovering over him, touching him. Uh, and I don't think we can impugn uh, any motive of Mr. Antolini, but the reaction of a screaming Holden waking up suggests that he has either been the victim of some kind of abuse in that prep school, which would not be unheard of, or he had worried about it so much that he continues to worry about it. His instinct, mishearing the lyrics of uh, coming through the rye and hearing catch for meat, and later on when his sister corrects him, he says that he learned later on that she was right. But in that moment, Back when he was 16, the moment of the book, he believed she was wrong. And he got the idea that what he'd like to dedicate his life to is catching these children, thousands of young children, all little. He's the biggest one among them, from running through a field and falling over a cliff. I am not the first person to realize that his first name might be a play on hold on, hold on, poor field. Uh, and that he has this desire because he wants to be uh, a savior of these young people from the world of death because he's seen it explicitly in Allie's death and implicitly in James Castle, who he mentions but doesn't uh, say much about. But James Castle, I think, can be seen as a kind of surrogate or double for Holden. He tells us that when he committed suicide, he was wearing the red sweater. Red is an important color in the book. Uh, his two siblings are red-haired. The calf that he gives to Phoebe that she throws back is red. Red is the color of sanguinity, ruddy fate of health. It's the color of blood, too. It's the color of other things. 
but I think in the novel, it's the color of sanguinity, which means both healthiness and hopefulness. Um, James Castle is wearing his sweater when Mr. Antolini uh, addresses the body. He tells us later on, Holden does, that they're side by side in a roll call, that um, Castle comes right before Caulfield. And the only reason to make that point, we could figure that out. We know how the alphabet works. We can imagine that there's not a name in between them, is to underscore that he sees um, James Castle as a version of himself. Why should he see this skinny, timid, uh, eventually self-erasing young man as a version of himself? It might just be empathy, which he's loaded with. It might be because he had a connection either emotionally or physically, factually, to James Castle. It may be that they were more than just uh, classmates together. It's certainly true that in his sacrifice of his own life, he's radically different from what Holden wants to do with his life. He doesn't want to die for children. He wants to live to save them. And I think it's unavoidable that in a novel that has lots of symbols, the carousel is a symbol, the duck hat, the hair, other things as well, uh, it's impossible to ignore that James Castle's initials, initials are JC, uh, initials of one of the famous saviors who does save people through self-sacrifice, who falls to a death of a kind that actually renders some good. Uh, I think that's something uh, that is not just my imagination. So in this tale that he tells us, like Huck, he performs by telling us his story. It's not a written text. He's telling this aloud, as Huck does. And he says, early in the novel, chapter four, all I need is an audience. I'm an exhibitionist. That's striking of this man, young man, who hides in the closet of his home when his parents are there, who seems to be both drawn to and fearful of self-erasure, erasure, not existing anymore. Uh, he admits that he's uh, an exhibitionist and he likes performing. He also says that he's a terrible liar and says it's a kind of act of self-promotion. So again, the mid-century writers who were engaged with this issue of how to depict alienated youth did not have them seek solutions in religion, philosophy, spirituality. They had them find it in themselves, not in the Emersonian way of mining what you have that is common to all people. Whitman said that in celebrating himself, what he will assume, we will assume. He says that at the very opening of his magnificent poem, Song of Myself. And people misread that meaning that what he takes for granted or believes, we have to believe. He doesn't mean assume in the sense of taking on a belief. He means assume in the sense of taking on a role. Uh, the role that he takes on, Walt Whitman, is he assumes the mantle, the role, the career of being himself. And we should do the same thing by being ourselves. He's going to model for us in this 52 section poem, how to be an American. And it's by being yourself song of myself he considered calling the poem song of oneself and he realized it didn't sound american that americans sing themselves well holden caulfield is telling the tale singing the tale of himself in the celebration of a least hundred year old tradition holden's self-reliance is not confident like emerson but confused it arises not from self-assertion entirely, but simultaneously from self-erasure and fear of death. That is, he both wants to be forgotten and he wants not to be forgotten. Nobody who wants to be forgotten says they're exhibitionist. Nobody who doesn't want to engage us with doubt tells us that they're a great liar. In the next to last chapter, as he's walking down Fifth Avenue, he states, 
then all of a sudden, something very spooky started happening. Every time I came to the end of a block and stepped off the GD curb, I had the feeling that I'd never get to the other side of the street. I thought I'd just go down, 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 and nobody's ever seen me again. It was very late in the novel when he seems to be getting together some sense of himself, uh, seems closer with Phoebe, um, sits in the rain because he's too old to be on the carousel with Phoebe. He doesn't want to be associated with the parents who are sitting under the shelter. So he sits in the limbo space. So much of the novel, um, he is in that limbo space of paying for a prostitute but not um, consuming her, as it were, and so on. Um, he fears that by stepping off a curb, he'll fall eternally down. You know, for the boys or the young children running through the field, it's a cliff. For James Castle, it took a building. For some people, it only takes a curb. And if you've ever dealt with anyone who has the kind of anxiety or fear or mental illness, uh, a curb, um, uh, a threshold can seem insurmountable. It's very powerful that that late in the novel, that image of falling uh, terrifies him. So I'm going to stop there uh, since I've talked, my Lord, for a full half hour. And I do intend to try to keep up as much as possible the interaction with all of you without just waiting to the end, especially if you would share with everyone uh, how you found or refound this book. Like um, the very different A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, this is a book that many people have memories of, whether they're fond or not, because they came to it, uh, if not when it first came out, at least much earlier in their lives. So I'm going to ask Michael if he'd be willing to channel. I'm more interested in comments right now than questions, what you all have to say about this novel that has been translated into dozens of languages, has sold millions and millions of copies. Although it's never been on the bestseller list, it has always sold well. Uh, it is a book that is taught in college, in high school and middle school. It's a book that is read even when it's not taught. Okay, well, we've got a couple of comments right off, Mark. Uh the first one is from someone who tried to read this 50 years ago in high school, couldn't finish it, read it this week, and is basically saying, this is a kid, a child who has been wounded by his brother's death, but the whole book seems to be an unending refrain of his inability to cope using repeated language. I don't understand how this makes the book revolutionary or valuable. Is this a book that represents a generation? In 1971, when I first tried to read it in high school, I didn't understand the importance, and I still don't. So um, it's an impossible question for me to answer. I, I can't, I can't tell you a book that you don't find important is important, but I think something we should not lose sight of. It becomes clear that this story that Holden is telling us happened the year before uh, and that when he told his sister he'd go west which is exactly where huck finn sets out for the territories he's going to go farther out west manifest destiny westward ho the american dream but holden is in a sanitarium he's in some kind of healthcare facility and he's being treated for his illness and this story that he has been telling us filled with the ramblings, the bad language, however this patron just described it, is something he's telling us while he's being treated. Somebody, maybe not Holden, but somebody has recognized that this self-isolating man, young man, needs help. And I have always thought of the novel as Holden's talk therapy. But unlike Huckleberry Finn, who is telling his story because he's an inveterate tale teller. He cannot stop from telling tales. There's a great scene in Huckleberry Finn where he's lying about the Duke and Dauphin 
being uh, from France, and he's lying. And a woman who doesn't believe him says, I'm going to make you swear on the Bible, um, and God will condemn you if you lie. And she brings down a big book from the bookshelf without noticing that it's a dictionary. It's a big old dictionary. And Huck Finn recognizes that it's a dictionary, and he feels relieved because he knows he can lie while swearing on the dictionary because it's not a Bible. Well, I'm sure that Mark Twain thought, why wouldn't Huck swear on a, on a dictionary? Language is his Bible. He's a person of words. Well, by contrast, Holden is not an audacious, uh, uh, inveterate liar and spinner of tales. He's a damaged boy who is ill. And by the end of the novel, we learn that he's somewhere where someone recognizes that. And I think it's impossible, certainly impossible for me, to avoid the conclusion that this story he's telling is part of his talk therapy. Whether it's been required of him that someone says, tell us about Phoebe, telling us, tell us about that Christmas when you left school uh, and left your sister um, and went to the hotel. Tell us about that or whether he just decided to tell it, it takes on a completely different register when you realize it's part of the cycle, possibly, of healing. And do you have another comment, Michael? I got a few more comments. Okay. Uh, next one says, I have always believed that Phoebe, whose name means light, is the guiding light for her brother Holden, and she leads him out of his confusion and into the light of sanity. Yes, I want to say that just last night uh, I did in Guilford the novel by Jasmine Ward called Sing Unburied Sing, which has a 13-year-old black boy in Mississippi post-Katrina in a very fractured home where his mother is a meth addict and he relies on the kindness of his mother's father and mother. And he has a three-year-old sister named Kayla K-A-Y-L-A, -A, who is named Michaela after the white father, but nobody but the white father calls her that because she's Kayla. And Jojo, this 13-year-old brother, is the parent for a three-year-old Kayla. And after his mother departs the scene at the end of the novel, he moves into his mother's bed and becomes a surrogate parent for little Kayla. But at the end of the novel, the unburied dead, it's called Sing, Unburied Sing. The unburied dead who've been haunting the people in the novel because they're restless for good reasons that you'll have to read the book to find out. It's time for them to go home. And the way they go home is that Kayla gets down, three years old, gets down from her grandfather's lap to sing them away. Not uh, in anger, but in love. And Jojo says to his sister, no, you can't get down. And the three-year-old says, yes, a word that is both defiant and affirmative. And she sings, and the spirits become pacified, like the action near the end of Beloved, when a young girl there sings, gets the townswomen to sing, and the collective act of singing exercises Beloved the former daughter who has now become a kind of poltergeist. And the last word of the novel that anyone speaks is home, home, which is where now Kayla and Jojo live with their loving grandparents and not the dysfunctional meth addicts of the mother and boyfriend. And the last spoken sound in the novel is Kayla saying to her older brother, shh, shh, S-H-H-H, -H -H. we're told, like a mother quieting a baby. That is, she rises to the ascendancy of the female in the family, and the shushing sound she makes is associated with lullaby and with the healing waters that her spiritual herbalist grandmother adored in her life. It's a magnificent scene of this little girl who is kind of an appendage uh, in the novel. The novel has three narrators. One of them is Jojo. One of them is his mother. One of them is a ghost. 
who is haunting the family. Kayla does not get to tell her own story, but Kayla gets the curtain call. And I do think that Phoebe is tremendously important in this book. I agree. Okay, so now the next person says, I read this in high school in 1962 and loved it. I just read it again and loved it just as much. Definitely the funniest book I've ever read and one of the most moving. I had a great family life, siblings who were alive and healthy, and a generally happy life. Yet I completely identified with Holden and felt he spoke to me about things I felt but could not begin to articulate. This was a very important book for me. Well, I want to say that I'm gratified, not because I need to hear that to make it worthwhile for me to show up tonight. I'm, I show up and I'm happy to do this, but I'm glad that among the comments, we could hear that comment because that's very typical of people that I know uh, who have backgrounds in literature and don't have backgrounds in literature, who are of my generation in their late 60s and of my children's generation in their 30s. Uh, and even people that I know who are high school and college students today. It is not universally loved, and it is a book that has suffered some datedness only because the style of his language is so unusual for a contemporary uh, teenage reader. But I do think it is a book that people um, love because as odd as he is, because he talks in the first person, and I think we don't understand that he talks without guile. He says he's a liar, but he's not a phony. Uh, we have a great sympathy for this very, very empathetic boy. Great. So see... so one, one more quick one, and then there's a one for at the end that's just an interesting factoid. But this person just said, with all the symbolism and depth of meaning for us, did Salinger anticipate that his book would be particularly interesting to teenagers? So that's not a comment. That's a question. So I'm going to move past that and let's have the factoid so I can get back to my... Oh, the, factoid is, the factoid is that this person wrote that Salinger wrote Catcher in the Rye in a house in North Stamford in a bedroom at the head of a spiral staircase. And the house is still there. And so is the staircase and the bedroom, just as he was where he wrote it. And this was told <laughs> to me by a librarian at Rowayton Library. Then it must be true. Told by a librarian, it must be true. Thank you, I appreciate that. And to the person who asked the question, I know that sounds dismissive, but again, in trying to control the shape of this course, this class, I was asking for comments. Um, I don't know the answer to what um, Salinger intended, but I was trying to focus on hearing from you what you thought of the book, so I liked that part of your comment. So late in Catcher, chapter 24, of its 26 chapters. The 25th chapter is the longest, 26 is very short. Mr. Antolini tells Holden, I have a feeling that you're writing for some kind of terrible, terrible fall. Uh, it was Mr. Antolini who gets to the body of the fallen, I mean, he jumped, but the fallen, James Castle. Uh, Holden wants to stop children from falling. I trust that you must have noticed that Holden, Holden falls a number of times in the novel. He falls in chapter six when Streitlater knocks him down in their dorm room. He says, next thing I knew, I was on the GD floor. My nose was bleeding all over the place because he got knocked down. When he's leaving school at the end of chapter seven, he tells us I damn near broke my crazy neck because someone had peanut shells on the steps. Um, at the uh, middle of chapter 13, when he lets the prostitute into the hotel room, he says, I had my suitcase right in my way and I fell over it and damn near broke my knee. So uh, bloody nose, near broke his crazy neck, near broke his knee. In chapter 14, when the elevator guy, who's also a pimp, a Maurice comes into the hotel room asking for money and punches Holden in the stomach. I wasn't knocked out or anything, but because I could remember looking up from the floor and seeing them both go out the door and shut it. So twice he's knocked down by a male in a room, dorm room, hotel room, and three times he's fallen. And now a fourth time in chapter 23, near the end, when he leaves 
his old home and Phoebe's room, he says, I nearly broke my neck on about 10 million garbage pails. Well, he falls when he's leaving school and nearly broke his crazy neck. He falls uh, in, the in the room where the prostitute is coming over his own suitcase and damn near broke his knee. And he falls when he leaves home for what may be the last time and nearly breaks his neck um, on about 10 million garbage pails. Um, all of these are stressors. Uh, leaving school, maybe about to have sex for the first time, which is uh, attractive and terrifying at the same time. Leaving his sister and his home. It's not just falling. It's nearly breaking your neck or your knee or your nose. Um, there's something frightening about this sense of falling. And one of the kinds of falls that there is, without putting an explicitly religious overtone to the book, is that you fall into adulthood. You fall into experience. You fall out of the world of innocence into the world of knowing more than you knew before. And it's something that terrifies him. But if, in fact, at the end of the novel, he is participating at least partly voluntarily, even if he wasn't subcommitted. Who knows what he found in California? Uh, there's a hope that this story that we've been told is not just a performance that is both amusing and moving. I find it both. I find parts of the novel laugh out loud funny, and I find it incredibly touching that he invents this career for himself based on a misunderstanding of a Robert Burns, Robert Burns poem of being the person who is going to save children. And when you know what the poem is, it's about a lass singing, might a body meet a body coming through the ride? Might you, in walking through a field of grain that's a lot higher than knee-level grass, might you meet another body, another person? And if you did, might you kiss that person? Now, whether that is an accidental meeting, or more likely, uh, an assignation by two people who say, you know, it'd be good to meet in the rye. We lie down in the field. Nobody can see us. If we recognize that that song is likely about sex and that tellingly Holden misses that reference and thinks of it about life and death and children, it's another kind of evasion, like not having sex with the prostitute or giving his money to the nuns right after he gives it to uh, the issue is the money to the prostitute. Um, he is a remarkably credible mix of someone who wants to try to be more grown up, more responsible, and is terrified of falling into experience. So it's in chapter 22 uh, when we tell hear about James Castle, a, a skinny little weak looking guy. And I want to say again, I'm not suggesting that there was anything homosexual uh, about James Castle. Uh, it's enough that he was puny, a weak looking guy. It's very clear that he's associated uh, with Holden through the turtleneck sweater that was lent to him and that he dies in. Very much on the next page associated with their names being back to back on the roll. And clearly uh, those initials I think are not accidental where if you're thinking about being a savior of humanity, uh, certainly that's one of the people uh, you might think of. The ducks are about things not staying the same. The carousel is an image of something staying exactly the same. You ride on the carousel and you wind up being where you started. It's a ride that takes you nowhere. And for many people, that's part of the fun. Uh, someone once did a study <clears throat> of American culture and said that one of the things that American culture is particularly interested in is moving and not getting anywhere. Uh, roller coasters, uh, carousels, not uniquely American, but distinctively American. Uh, bubble gum, uh, not bubble gum, chewing gum is an American invention. You chew it. Do you swallow it? No. Does it give you nutrition? No. Are you eating it? No. You're chewing it. What do you, you chew it? You chew it, and then you don't. Um, it is not eating. It's not nutrition. 
the idea of going for a drive, uh, going out for a drive, was something that existed before the American colonies, I'm sure. But the idea in the 50s and 60s and beyond of going out uh, on the interstate highway in your car and that what you were doing for your activity was driving out to drive back. You weren't visiting, you weren't touring, you were taking a ride. That's American. And their argument, these writers, these critics, was that there's something about America that is so restless, it's fascinated by motion and mobility, even though it doesn't necessarily have a goal in mind. Just moving, just doing uh, is enough. And those same writers point out that in many American novels, and I would include this one, the novel doesn't conclude, it just stops. So there's no resolution at the end of The Scarlet Letter, even though um, Hester Prynne has been told she no longer has to wear the mark of shame. She not only continues to wear it, it is put on her tombstone. So even in death, she wears the letter and she never gets past the letter by her own intention. And at the end of um, Huckleberry Finn, when he's told that he didn't do a bad thing ultimately because Jim had been freed all along. we Nobody knew it, even the reader didn't know it, but Jim was free. He thought he was running away, he was free. It's Twain's way of having it both ways. What does Huck decide to do? Settle down again with Aunt Sally and the world of civilization and soap? No, he's gonna head out for the wilderness, which is exactly where he started 300 pages before. This novel ends by saying, I'm sorry I told so many people about it. About all I know is I sort of miss everybody I told about. Well, if this is now a fact, a consequence of the talk therapy, that's healthy. That by telling about these people, he misses them. Even old Stradlater and Ackley, for instance, I think I even miss that goddamn, oh, that G.D. Maurice. It's funny. Don't ever tell anybody anything. If you do, you start missing everybody. That's a stopping rather than a conclusion. That is, that's his advice that we're not supposed to take seriously. The whole novel is a testament to telling. And these writers that I've been talking about, these critics say that uh, continental novels of the 19th and early 20th century, British novels of the early 20th century, the 19th century, they conclude, reader, I married him. Somebody gets the money or the girl or the guy or the will, the inheritance, the knowledge, figures out the secret. Uh, they conclude there's a sense of resolution. But American novels stop. Uh, some of you know the end of The Sopranos. Just stops. Uh, and these writers say, it's very American because it's distrustful of the notion that there is a resolution. The kind of restlessness is about moving, chewing, riding a roller coaster, riding a carousel. And where do you get to? Nowhere. The journey is the experience. So I hope the overarching idea that this book is partly a product of deep-seated alienation by these writers and intellectuals that mid-century, especially as a response to the complacency of materialistic um, Philistine America, meeting the rise of the teenager, not as just a, a boy or girl, usually almost always a boy, of a teenage year, but this self-isolating, rebellious, countercultural figure that we're going to see in an older version and more than one next time in On the Road. Thank you. That's great, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, we'll just, you know, we'll give people a minute or two if they want to type in a, a, a final question or a comment. One thing, I, one thing I want to mention is that, you know, I hadn't actually thought of the one thing you mentioned that I found very interesting. I hadn't actually thought about this as if it was almost like a transcript of a therapy session. And it, it, it makes me actually view the whole book differently. Uh, when when some years ago they made a remake uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio of um, The Great Gatsby, Buzz Lerman did it, 
and I think it was a mixed success. But with books that I've taught and with works that I admire, I almost always find, whether it's a play that's being done as a movie or a novel, that there's something in the new version that gives me another angle of vision. And in that version of The Great Gatsby, again, I don't think it was a particular success. They figure, they they represent the story being told uh, because I think it's F. Scott Fitzgerald, but it might be Nick, is actually in a alcohol rehab institution. And he's telling the story as part of his therapy. And of course, uh, Fitzgerald was somebody with alcohol addiction. He did write a collection of pieces called The Crack Up, which was meant to be a pun on both an automobile crack up, and there's one famously in The Great Gatsby, and it is um, fatal for somebody, but also the crack up of your mental abilities. And I thought it was a perfect metaphor, not in the book, but one of the things movies can do is add to or change things about a book. A perfect thing to think of The Great Gatsby as either Nick or Fitzgerald behind Nick trying to tell a story uh, that heals. Uh, this is more obvious that it's in the novel. Holden tells us that this is where he is now a year later. And we don't know till the end that the immediacy in the novel from the very beginning is not actually immediate. It's actually a year old. And it was immediate when he was telling it. So we experience it in the present but he actually has some distance from it. I think that's a brilliant strategy on the part of J.D. Salinger. Yep. I think you made a great point. Um, I think that uh, that may be it. There's no other comments. People had a few questions, a few moments if they wanted to add it. So, folks, I did send out that email uh, in, in the middle of this. Yes, Mark, I was still paying attention, but I wrote an email and sent it to everybody. You and can I do whatever you like, Michael. You can do no wrong. Get, I can get away with all kinds of things when I'm on mute with the camera off. The um, so I've got responses from some people, and they'll you know please reply tomorrow or in the course of the weekend. And if we get enough people and everything holds uh, holds the status quo, we'll do it. Either way, I'll let everybody know early next week. So uh, thanks, Mark, again for great lecture. We're looking forward to next week on the roads. Another book I haven't read in a long time, but I'm definitely going to reread that. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Wilton Library. Bye. Good night.